Buenas tardes, bienvenidas y bienvenidos a la apertura de la app, a la laboratoria de pensamiento de la Universidad de Lugar, en la que esta es una edición. Pensaba que el programa eh, va a comenzar a empezar también ya de crear un espai, una zona de contacto con medio de actitud, pero sobre todo esta referencia a la, posibil a la posibilidad de crear este espai común, un espai de trobada, de reflexión compartida, a un siguiente capaz de pensar quién son las rectas que el presente nos apara y cómo puede afrontar realmente un futuro en, en dignidad. Las rectas son muchas y de hecho voy a la conversa que podemos ver. Uh, el programa considera un de los ejes troncales de, del museo, es como una de las líneas estructurales de la atención también, no, uh, no només en el programa mateix, sino como a la medida que pasa a las los módulos, las jugadas, las ponentes, la dama de vuestro cita, etc., también es modificar estas maneras de hacer. Ya tenemos que yo creo que sabemos que ya no es lo mismo que el de qué tal que sino cómo tal que es. Y que no son estas maneras, estos gestos, estas acciones, que se van a hacer más de forma cotidiana y diaria, que se caracterizan y son las que de alguna manera arreglan a que mal y a que es conflicto de acceso a la como también, de alguna manera, se ha escrito el título de Mareu, de múltiples crisis no resoltas. Antes de continuar, voy a agradecer a las nuevas compañías, a la Berta, a Leva y a la Pilar, entre las cuatro que me mandaban a este proyecto, que no es fácil, y que son ya dos años, ya de tres, porque algunos de vosotros ya sabéis, pues que otros no, han comenzado prácticamente una semana o dos antes de la pandemia. Este es el título, como se tiene en la mano, esta zona de contacto, para que es un momento de no contacto que han tenido, donde no, esta casualidad, hasta de aquellas cosas regionarias, porque ya sabíamos que se mareó no de una crisis sanitaria, ni de una climática, ni de una bélica, ni de una económica, sino de muchas de ellas que históricamente no me atan. También volví a dar las gracias a los tutores, a Sebastián, a Iván, a Arquitectives, David, Rafael. En país tampoco sería posible, con todos los de estos conductores, los otros mediadores, ¿no? si están en contacto con los ponentes, con los alumnos, pero también con la sociedad civil. Creo que las personas, de alguna manera, durante todos los que medios tienen las antenas abiertas y nos ayudan a, a, a repensar y a poder modificar también la duda que, que el curso avanza. Y para resultar a los participantes, sin saber atrás, no sería posible, y no son números para aulas, son totalmente imprescindibles, porque son los únicos que nos permiten para la comunidad de una comunidad que genera el museo y que permite pensar en aquel museo eh, de un espai habitable, de un espai compartido, que genera nuevas dinámicas que sí traspasan, es decir, que hablamos del museo de una manera purosa, que traspasan a la sociedad. De fet, el tret diferenciador del marc de este año respecto a la pasado es también cómo hemos enfocado a esta parte más práctica o activa desde un punto de vista funcional. Uh, precisamente para que se eh? porque han dicho que usted era, podría ser útil, ser capaz de usar, porque están sin módulos, eh? uh, repensar la institución, feminismo, fronteras, ecologismo, o trabajo, están íntimamente relacionados, uh, y dicen que usted se presenta una, hoy en día no se puede hablar de la otra, la empresa que han trabajado de forma individual, sin embargo, que está para más práctica. A que están en cambio, eh, en vez de un documento que se irá trabajando en vez de que vaya a tener lloc los módulos, un documento que tiene el objetivo de hacer una especie de código o manual de buenas prácticas eh, culturales, sociales, etc., y que volem facilitar a la, a la espai polític, a, a los diferentes gobiernos, esperando, obviamente, a que alguna cosa se serveixi y, y els facilitem saber ubicar quins son los problemas reales. No me voy a alargar un mes, porque hoy también venimos a, a tener el placer, el honor de, de presentar. Lo teníamos nosotros a Francis Mori, que es el más posible de la vida. Muchos de vosotros lo sabéis, Francis Mori es la actual directora de la Tech Modern uh, de Londres. Tiene una trayectoria muy, muy amplia uh, y, es, y obviamente es muy reconeguda por múltiples facetas, por líneas estructurales que pueden afirmar que han modificado y transformado el que hoy es la TEI. Eh, Como veremos hoy a la cerrada, 
una de ellas está hecha por una concienciación medioambiental importante, pero, en el caso de Vigui, también, no es mala de reconocer que va a ser la primera dona en dirigir la Cape Moda. Una cosa que ya parla molt ¿no?, de este eh, apuntamiento y de estas necesidades y transformaciones que cal a terme. Hablar de feminismo hoy no es muy només a, a abordar una cuestión de género, pero hablar de feminismo eh, hoy en día vol dir apuntar la estructura mitjançant la cual el nuestro sistema se configura. Vol dir abordar un, el tema racial, de clase, medioambiental y obviamente también el, el de género. Eh, Francis Morris, cuando va dirigir la CEIP, no le era tampoco al IE, la SPAI, ella va entrar al 87, por tanto, hacía prácticamente tres décadas que ya estaba al museo y alguna vez se conocía muy bien desde allí. No citaré todos los artistas a los que ha trabajado, porque también son múltiples, desde Luis Bonsoir, a Yacoy Kusama, a Agnès Martin, a quien empezaron los años, a mí también. Pero sí, me gustaría hablar de la apertura de la mostra de l'any 2000, a una colectiva que va pensar en la colección, va a abrir de una nueva manera de entender de allí las obras de arte, no solo en relación con las mateixes, sino también con el mundo en el que, en el que vivimos. Una lectura transversal que uno, a una historia, a pensamiento, activismo y muchas otras cuestiones. Eh, para acabar, y ya no, no me añado un mes, sí comentar dos pequeñas anécdotas, no creo que sigui a casualidad, que en una plataforma de Latinoamérica, eh, un grupo de... una plataforma feita por un grupo de activistas, artísticas, agentes culturales, que tienen diferentes categorías y que el objetivo de las cuales es esdevenir un espai de memoria ¿no? y reconocimiento a donas emprendedoras, y también a Sánchez Morris, no, Sánchez Morris con el concepto bacana. ¿no? Es una mujer bacana para ella, es de diferentes etiquetas, y creo que es una cosa muy especial ¿no? que ella utilice así. Uh, sin me está y bueno, esta buena anécdota ya que si tengo, es una casualidad, pero con preparada a la gran entrevista para dirigir a aquel museo, con preparada la entrevista, eh, obviamente, miraba diferentes documentos y va a probarme una entrevista que le hicieron a internet, donde ella hablaba de hacer la visión de un museo, una, museo, una visión integral. Y le una frase que es, es tan importante, no només las exposiciones, los programas, etc., sino también desde el libro que tiene la librería, sin el plat que es mientras el restaurante. Bueno, ahora también tenemos un restaurante, nosotros en casa, estamos en ello, pero re, no me explica, gracias Francis por acompañarnos a Luis, Francis va a ir más, entre los oídos, para que los tal. Gracias.
and also my my successors, the firm and pros might want to do things in a sense. So this is kind of a really interesting exercise for me, so thank you. Um, but I am speaking, and I absolutely need to clarify uh, that I am speaking as a practitioner, uh, not a therapist, and not as a teacher. I just, um, you know, I'm a worker. Uh, my professional career um, has been formed by the museum or the institution right from the start, and by interactions rather than independence, if you like. It's nothing I've done, I've done in collaboration, in partnership, sometimes in opposition, but it began with art history, more you know, you know, tough academic art history, and then I met artists. And talking to a most productive studio completely changed my understanding of what art history meant. Then, of course, I became a curator, and from curating with the exhibitions, I began to work with the collection at Tate, and eventually had a leadership role in collecting. And that brought me into the realm of fundraising and philanthropy. And then, of course, as director of modern government has been a major framework of the last almost decade. And because I run an institution where I believe absolutely profoundly that the, 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 the person of the recycling um, is as important as the personal of the potential, I'm absolutely involved in the people who walk through the door and their experience, and indeed with the people who don't walk through the door, so the community, and for the most part, in recent years, longer community, and that has brought me to activism. So I want to try and touch on that arc uh, during my talk tonight. So I joined Kate in the late 1980s, at least in the, in the UK, in Great Britain. The reason for them experienced a very long period of kind of confidence, and of course, confidence of necessity leads to complacency. Very complacent about my role in society. They had always worked with a very clear mandate, with a mission, mission statement to increase enjoyment and understanding in art. That was a sort of foundational mission statement for Kate. It was very much based on a more or less perfect assumption of the intrinsic value of art. That art was just important. It didn't really matter what you did with it, but it was important. So that kind of philosophy combined with this belief that I encountered as I write it, that there was a canon of art, there was a given list of artists that were the great and the good, made lots of decisions in the museum about what to acquire, uh, what to put on the walls, what exhibitions to make. Now there's the stuff is very easy and comfortably consensual uh, within the institution. But of course it was the beginning also, just as a turning point of a crisis for cultural institutions, really certainly in the Western world. And as the crisis of representation and access of ownership, of government, of public trust and relevance, and we're still, I think, now in the art of crisis. So those old-fashioned institutions, and, and the point when I joined it was really old-fashioned, they were visibly being shaken by this great wave of radical thinking that was taking place in the, in the 1970s in, 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 in the academic world, in universities. So the kind of first wave of feminism, of structuralism, of post-colonial studies, and the beginning of the institutional critique, amongst artists, for example, there were things that the new more generation just really swept away those processes and prompted, I think, the beginnings of a kind of commitment to a form of professional development in this that was based on critical self-reflection. And in a way, I think that's what's happening with the seminar this week. It's a form of self-reflection within our institutional context. And with the money, again, the as the author found in the master, that again, there was a sense of the possibility of reinvention. 
and the audience for that was provided by the sort of really the the, the sort of neoliberal value values thanks to the economic, social, and geopolitical structures and relationships that, that surrounded uh, the institution. So that was very, very much still the beginnings of now, and now has a long tail. And unimaginably, when we think about what we just come through, and we're still going through this, a period of now acute crisis. Uh, and since we go an immediate and out of the blue crisis, COVID, but instilling, I think, for many of us in the culture sector, both the real uh, possibility of annihilation, but at peak, we will have to call for 200 days, causing an absolutely huge um, deficit of my finances. You know, our, our teams are half the size they were, our programs are hard. So at the same time, though, COVID created this wonderful period where, and I'm sure this happened to many of you, we reflected upon our lives. We understood something of why we had got to this terrible place. And we kind of dreamed that when we came out of it, we would do things differently. And for us, it was an extraordinary period, a year of magical thinking, we called it, all the time that COVID was going on. And I wanted to share this quote with you know, at the time I found totally inspirational, it's from a great author, um, Indian author, um, Alan Jaffe Roy, from an essay written called uh, Pandemic as a Portal. Uh, and they wrote, it was a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. And we can choose to walk through it, covering the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our others, our data banks, and our dead ideas, our dead rivers, and our smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world, and ready to fight for it. And I think we in the climate that we thought that's what it would be like. We could, we could know, we would see clear water ahead of us, but the, the, the COVID, uh, bringing forth the, the, the kind of realization of climate emergency and the intersection of those multiple emergencies at the heart of culture war, suddenly we would all see with clarity. The more precise version of this, of course, was that Boris Johnson's announcement that we could build back better. But there was for a moment a kind of possibility that we could reinvent the museum in the aftermath of COVID. But those, those visions are slipping away right now, and very, very quickly. I saw it in my museum, and I regret that. And I think that's because for many of us, what the crisis of COVID has revealed, like the kind of tip of a newly emerging iceberg, is really just the deeper global crisis underground. Is that all around us, threatening the fate of our planet and people in mind? It's quite clear, as I said, that climate crises, intersect with other crises, the economic, um, the crises that, I mean, that museums like mine are facing on a daily basis, that actually date from the foundational century of museums. So that age of enlightenment, ironically enlightenment, was also the era when nature was separated from culture, put on one side. It's the date when the extinction of land rights and justice peoples uh, date from it. The, 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 the dominance of the Western values come from the Enlightenment period of patriarchy, of competition and growth as core values as good things. So those kind of uh, originating myths of most, the multiple inequalities and exclusions between global north and south, between races and genders of education, the access of representation and empowerment and human rights and freedom of speech. And I know that might seem a long way from the museum, but actually museums are at the epicenter of all those issues. And the agenda, in fact, for the laboratory of art and thought is nothing if not timely. Because the more it's still to the fore of kind of concepts and ambitions and challenges, but actually, I think we've been wrestling with 
for the most part, been a victory, I have to say, for most of my career. And despite all that we have tried to achieve, there is so, so much more that we need to do to create relevance, value, and above all, trust. I think trust is a really important term when we talk about museums. Trust in art, in artists, and trust in the very institution, the very building, the very spaces without which our museums and galleries would simply not survive. And what I wanted to do, uh, really having that, you know, long preamble, is really talk about, you know, if not now, when. Uh, there's a long, we've been engaging with visitors for a very, very long time. And there's an absolute sense of urgency now, in my view, that they've been able to become real and be centered. And I want to talk about some case stories at Kate, but before that, just because I know a lot of people who are interested in the institution, and um, it's very easy when we have these gatherings to talk through. And many people have written brilliantly, provocatively, helpfully, theoretical texts that frame a lot of the kind of thing that I do. But actually, ideas are important, but we don't, we don't live in theory. We live in places like this, we live in buildings. Um, and buildings have complex agendas. And this is an image of what I would call the four discourses of the Public Art Museum. And I, I stole this from a colleague who, one of her four discourses was research. I decided to take research out and put government in service. These are the things, these are the agendas that more or less sit behind any museum building. Any art museum, and a particularly a contemporary art museum, you have the discourse of art and artists, which is, of course, absolutely core. It's the lifeblood. It's why museums were there in the first place. But museums have to connect with the public, and their structures of governance that create their ethical codes and their, their independence of, of conflicts of that, 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 that reserve their conflicts of interest, that give their sort of Framework. And of course, they need to survive. They may have money from uh, public funds, from the government, they may be privately owned, but they have a discourse of financial sustainability. And finally, they have to have some sense of public value, particularly if they're public institutions. But what has been very clear to me from day one in the museum is those four things don't sit very happily together. Certainly when I arrived at Kate, but the discourse of artists and the collection was absolutely paramount. But now, as we enter the, you know, the middle years of the 21st century, that discourse of public value is becoming increasingly important, as is the discourse of financial sustainability. But those two don't necessarily stick comfortably together. And as a director of the museum, it's balancing those four things across everything we do, there's a real challenge. So the other um, little graphic I wanted to show you is the, 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 the value of triangle. We talk more strongly in the art world about value, talk about the value of art. But do we actually understand what value means and the registers of value? There are many different types of value at play with an art. One of the, one of the bits of value that isn't on this graphic, but it's hugely important in a city like London, that was the subject of an entire other lecture, or needs to be, is market value, the financial value, the, the, the price we put on the work of art. But these are more about unpicking the idea of the sort of, um, when we walk into this, you know, what, what's happening to us. So, the, this is a triangle that was um, invented by a guy called John Holden for um, a democratic, uh, a think tank, a democratic think tank, who so did some really interesting work on value between 2005 and 2015, which has been very influential to kind of understand the complexity of value. And it looks at the uh, three interrelated, interrelated strands that can be kind of emotional value, the aesthetic value, the spiritual, the kind of historic value, but we have the, 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 the artist present. We've just been talking about the, the cosmic, the, 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 the emotional, spiritual meaning of art. I'm sure all of you in the audience 
could some art mean something to you. It will intrinsically go. Because it's absolutely sort of a given. So I was expressed as a personal experience. It's real. You own it. It's incredibly difficult to measure. There's no register of intrinsic value. And people who don't understand art, cynic, my government, for example, simply don't get it. It's a meaningless quality. So the second register of value here is what we call instrumental value. And all the time I've been in the art world, this is the, the only piece of value that governments and funders actually understand. This is about how you demonstrate how your institution contributes to economic or social purpose. The output and impact, and there's the sort of things that you can try and measure: how many jobs, you know, whether educational standards go up or whatever. And then finally, and this is the most elusive of all, and the one that I think for practitioners means so much, is what we call institutional value, which is that kind of more intangible idea, more kind of updated version of what the 19th century, 19th century museum directors or visionaries thought of as public good. And it references the kind of way we as institutions behave, the way we hold ourselves, but in our dealings with our public, our respect for our public, our public are our guests. And it includes the kind of, the kind of notion of trust that somehow we hold collections and trust for the public. And also that ethos of public service. And those values, I hope, we can take into the rest of the century, but I think they are the core values that are most at risk, most at, at, at stress in, in, in the area in which we're living through now. And I can make other triangles, but it's quite fun to do so, but, you know, other triangles might make our job even more difficult than it is. Um, and I just wanted to start both these graphics because I think that most the um, filming devices so really demonstrate how the world of the museum is actually just a tiny little world, a little network work, a little complex and tangled thing that is inextricably bound up into a much broader culture, you know, defined as our way of life, how we want to put it. So I'm going to be talking about three experiences at Cape Mad. They're almost three different time frames, I would say. So the first is the kind of evolutionary time frame of the movement, the long history of the poor conditions for, in a way, the fact that we need to change and that we need repair. And of course, as you all know, but it's worth remembering, um, the origins of the museum in the kind of Greco Roman um, pantheon on top of the Aquipus, 5th century BC. And the size, of course, is faith, ritual, power, learning, democracy. And of course, that is also the era, going back in time, that really can date the birth of this idea of the canon, the idea of beauty, the elevation of the artist. And so these are ideas of, uh, of the intrinsic and the institution of very, very firmly embedded uh, in the foundational museums from the 18th and 19th century, the first public museums. And of course, um, that, that model is reflected in so much museum architecture across Europe and America. And this is a picture of Tate Gallery, which was a museum that dates from the 1890s. And, and now, and architecture is such a powerful metaphor, isn't it? You know, up the stairs, the grand mirror plus the front, the portico and the columns, the tenure on top, flying the union jack, you know, nation, empire, civic responsibility, elevation, um, privilege, right from the inception, they are all there in the architecture of the Cape Gallery. Um, of course, that model has changed during the course of the 20th century, and uh, even for the extraordinary um, appropriation of museum building uh, in the uh, last 20 years or so, but the, the kind of paradigm shift 
if one can identify them, I think would be more than the uh, genesis of Pope Martin. I would cite, first of all, the um, uh, Norma, uh, the, the introduction in the, um, oh, which one? Norma, sorry. This is the old Norma, but not unlike the new Norma. Um, the first part of modern museum, a museum reflective of a new generation of modern artists. Artists whose work was withdrawn from the real world into abstraction, uh, foregrounding kind of purely aesthetic notions of form or beauty, color, uh, kind of theoretical and spiritual, and the building very purposefully designed to show that kind of work to its best effect, the white cube, but also designed around a particular narrative of the evolution of art with a kind of uh, theological narrative of art history leading to the development of abstraction. So a kind of a, a powerful metaphor for modernism in Melbourne, the first foundational movement of modern art, and incredibly influential. We live with the legacy of MoMA in our collections, in our galleries, in the way we hang art, um, very deeply embedded, even now. And then the other major innovation in the last century uh, was the example of Pompidou. Um, and Pompidou was a, a, a museum that, um, just like Noma, responded to the, um, the belief systems of, and, and, and ways of working of uh, artists of its era. So Pompidou also was reflecting a kind of change in tempo in contemporary art. This is the beginning of live art, of uh, collaborative projects, of art as activism. So this is so much more a model to bring the people in, a kind of a purpose palace, um, for changing the white cube model. So it's from almost an oppositional model. Interestingly, and, and those of you who will have visited uh, Pompidou, it was interesting to see that the, although the building is indeed based on a kind of fun palace model, once you get to the galleries in Pompidou that contain the National Museum of Contemporary Art, the model reverts to a MoMA model of traditional white cube galleries, which just shows you how embedded that the MoMA model is. But those are the two um, models that um, that Tate uh, had before it, there were three models, the original, the classical Tate Gallery, the MoMA and Pompidou, were, were the three models that um, uh, um, we were uh, looking at uh, when we came to uh, think about Tate Modern. And Tate Modern was effectively a hybrid of those three models built into an existing building. And this is a picture of a bunch of power station taken in the uh, um, actually, I think it's not from the early mid 90s, it must be much uh, earlier because it's got smoke coming out of the chimney. So, this image must, must be from the 1980s um, before um, the building was decommissioned. Um, what I wanted to um, so about the building and we talked about some models, but the business of curating uh, had, by this stage, by the 1990s, I'm talking about, had moved on significantly from the business of curating that I encountered when I first joined its place in the 80s. And, but again, that, the changing nature of curating was very much influenced by changing artistic practice. And this, this was the continuous theme of everything I say, that Artists, artists all show the way. If you're listening and watching, artists are, you know, we, 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 life is understood backwards. We all, we think historically, we always look back, but it's lived forwards, and artists are very good at living life forwards. And, um, it, it was the two sort of interconnected zones of institutional critique in artist practice. If an museum is new, there's artists with taking down the museum and criticizing it. But it was the artists working within relational aesthetics. So thinking about how you engage people in your space, how, what does it mean? The, 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 the visitor, the viewer, becomes a kind of contributing part of the experience. 
And for me, um, my colleague dictates, I think the conditions for acknowledging the need for reinvention came essentially from understanding that the model, the foundational model, and those additional well, thinking models from Mama and Pompidou were no longer really fit for purpose. Uh, no longer serving the kind of narrative of contemporary art. There was no room in the Alfred Bar model, the Mama model, for relational aesthetics, for example. But it's just, you know, it doesn't fit in. There's no room really in the fun palace for institutional critique. And why did they say that those models were actually serving the public? Well, we're all very increasingly aware of the mechanics of exclusion from the canon. Artists were telling me that they were excluded. They were knocking on the door, begging to be let in. They were making their own exhibitions of other stories. And that was a real decisive moment of, you know, do you do you go with contemporary artists or do you stay without history? I remember we, we, at Tate in, in early in 93, we had an anniversary rehang of our collection. And it was beautiful. But I walked around it and looked at the works that had been picked out of icons of our collection. There were a hundred of them. No artist of colour was amongst those hundred icons. And there were only two women. And it felt fundamentally, so sort of philosophically, ethically wrong. At the same time, kind of developments in uh, music and education and interpretation were shifting the sense of cultural practice. Affording the creator kind of greater agency and, uh, and a greater accountability. I think that's the word. And I remember incrementally uh, the growing perception that kind of traditional methodologies of show and tell, put it on the wall and walk away and let people assume that they know what they're talking about. They were simply reinforcing the privileges of a Muslim public already privileged by class and education. And we've done some really interesting work about who comes to the museum. And it is it is still the case that we serve a very privileged audience, privileged by birth, by socioeconomic status, and of course by education. But even so, the introduction of interpretation was, and, and amazingly still is now, hotly contested, particularly at this moment of cultural wars, what you say really matters. But when we were building, had the opportunity in 1997, I was invited to join a term of three, one of three curators, very young, we were all under 40, in conceptualizing the, the, the kind of curatorial the artistic program for the new museum, we absolutely were determined to do things differently. We just were. It was an ambition to sweep away the past. We didn't know what the future held, but we wanted to kind of create a break with the past, and we wanted to do it very publicly and very openly. I think we believe that the beginning of the new century, very simply, a museum could not simply tell one story, talk with one voice, or address one audience. You know, London was already an enormously diverse, multiracial society, uh, with great range of um, different communities. And we were looking at a world where contemporary art was no longer defined by Western Europe and North America. The world was traveling to, you know, Istanbul, to Delhi, um, to Rio. There were great artists at centers, not margins, all over the world. So, it actually does seem incredible in today's day with the world well, that there were three curators, actually one of whom was an educational curator, amazing. Uh, in their 30s, with almost no leadership experience, um, Charles to plot the future of London's art at the MoMA. But what we discovered, we discovered through research, travel, conversation, and debate. And the two, I think, the really, maybe this is one thing, but what we really discovered that was terribly important, I think, is that artists are time travelers. 
I talked about artists like Paul, but they look back to us in really interesting ways. They stir the past in ways that are profoundly different to the way artists still see the past, and they push at the future. And so what we did very simply, so simple that it was complex at the time, was to follow their lead. We decided to dispense, um, it didn't seem magical at the time, uh, hang on, so I'm just going to move, uh, just get back a moment to the architecture, just to describe what's going on here. So I'm looking at a cutaway of Tate Modern. And on the right hand side, I mentioned that Tate Modern's a hybrid. On the right hand side of this part, you see the, the floors of galleries stacked up. And that's really interesting, despite all, I'm sure, my director's best endeavours, our galleries are pretty conventional white cube spaces. And that they are distributed in sort of classical art style. It's impossible to get away from history. Maybe that's not a bad thing, it wasn't the right moment to dispense with the white cube, but the kind of history of the institution was embedded in those spaces. But the, so that was a sort of MoMA and Tate Gallery combined with the hybrid. But then on the south side of Tate Modern, in the old turbine hall, the architects created this huge open space. This is kind of our version of Pompidou. So it combined all three different types of museum. It kind of blew away all models in that combination. And what we decided to do in this rather conventional gallery, the gallery is to cut a long story short, was actually to break, not a clear break with the past, by breaking with the convention of art history being best or only understood, really, so many people think, understood chronology. And at the same time, to break with the conventional way of displaying art by nationality, and by medium. And even now, when you go to museums across the world, especially museums in slightly in markets, in, in slightly smaller cities, which haven't had change, you will often have to that, you know, schools, Spanish school, German school, photography wing, you know, bibliotech. So we just decided to create a complete um, amalgamation, take down those borders between the barriers that stop us as the audience doing what artists do, artists leapfrog. They don't see a problem. The painter doesn't see a problem being influenced by a photographer. He goes to the Cezanne exhibition at Tate Modern on now. What is extraordinary is you see the history of sculpture in Cezanne's painting. You see Henry Moore, you see Matisse, you see Richard Sayer, you see Giacometti. You can't see those things if you don't bring those things together. And it helps people understand that those things are related, that, you know, that art is full of intersections. It's, quite, it's trans-historical, it's transnational. So, I think we also very much put the contemporary artist at the fore, that understanding that all our historical understanding is mediated through contemporary experience. And contemporary experience is our kind of version of this idea of lived experience, or what some hearts of stories call the period eye. You know, the idea that we all see with our, we bring, we bring our bodies, we bring our genders, we bring our place of birth, we bring our family, we bring our histories to the way we see and the way we understand. So it was about empowering the audience as well. So we took away the historical narrative. Um, and instead, we put in the place four subject areas. And these subject areas were, were as we thought, um, closely associated with contemporary notions. So, uh, one of them was the environment. Like, even then, we were thinking about the environment, you know, 20 years before, 20 years before we declared a climate emergency. The environment, uh, the body, the body at center, society. Um, real life, real life experiences, and then they connected those very contemporary themes to the kind of genres from which you can tangibly connect, you can tangibly connect uh, the very art of the just society with the origins of social engagement history painting, um, artists using the body, the reference back to the depiction of the nude, real life connecting to still life, 
the study of objects, the places in which we occupy, um, environment into landscape. And each then um, I started in series that there are different types of displays. We took the kind of exhibitionary model that each room could be slightly different type of display, monographic, a pairing, a thematic and in focus. And it was at the time, it seems so conventional now, but at the time it was so radical that it was universally derided in the press. I mean, I find it astonishing now that we may make great projects. We're so thrilled when we get great press coverage, but actually, when we really want to challenge the world, you get bad press coverage, and we shouldn't be um, afraid of it. But the key thing about the opening display was that it was not intended ever to be a permanent display. It was the idea of a permanent collection, permanently changing, not to celebrate the art, not to tell the story, but to interrogate it, to open it up to new ideas, not always getting answers, but kind of posing new questions. So a work would be seen in one juxtaposition for a year, and then in another for another. So continuously changing the course of the conversation. As we walk through life, where our life moves on to different conversations, different contexts with different people. So it was really establishing the collection that displays themselves as a kind of laboratory of ideas. And, and I still find this the most incredibly all-consuming, puzzling, thrilling environment to work in, where you, where you just are moving the things around all the time. Nothing that needs to be fixed because, because we move on all the time. The world moves on and our responses move on. And it was very influenced by a uh, post-colonial theorist called Stuart Hall, who talked about collections in a really amazing way, but he talked about them as temporary stabilizations. They are only always captured something in a moment in time, and then time moves on, so they move on. So it, it sets us, I think, as the terms for a different kind of engagement with contemporary art and audiences. And it did, it did um, act as a rupture. Um, and so, you know, I think the, 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 the rupture helped us at Kate, and as, as new curators came on board, helped us build the case. But um, it, it made it shockingly clear that there were no women in the collection. It made it staggeringly clear that there were no um, black artists on display. Those exclusions that had been invisible when we were talking about the sort of canonical history were suddenly everywhere. It, then it drove and helped drive the adventure that I was involved in for the next 10 years, which was building the bigger and broader collection and bringing in artists and practices that had been as it were marginalised um, by gender or race, for example, or by the marketplace, for example. Uh, and that's another story. But um, interestingly, the, um, you know, this is important, I think, for the conversations with work, is that of the trio, this wasn't just a curatorial conversation, but the very powerful voice was a young woman, younger than Ivana Blazic, former director of the White Chapel, and myself, who were the two. Curators of the young Carol Howe, who's just been appointed as the director of London's Imperial War Museum. But having her take on learning and public engagement foregrounded kind of the, the interaction with the audience from day one as foundational. And I've always thought that you cannot run a museum with separate departments of curating and learning, but the things are just inextricably combined. And it's unbelievably difficult to keep. To achieve it. I'm unable to achieve it at Cape Modern, but the conversation, the empowerment has to be there. One of the, one of the um, although it's not institutionally, um, it's not worth an institution, the conversation that takes between learning and curator is very powerful and it's very collegiate. And one of the most exciting things that I think I've seen over the last 20 years is a shift from the kind of pre-2000 institution, where there were in the world what we call two art histories. There was the art history out there in the university, and then there was the art history in the museum. And in the university, it was all about ideas. It was the kind of theory, it was about challenging the status quo, and it was driving the debate forward. And in the museum, 
It was all about the object and its material nature and how to preserve it and where it came from and its bibliography and its provenance. And so that was very old fashioned museum art history and parodying it a little bit. But what would be really exciting to see is how in the last decade or so, museums have just caught up and are really driving research in a, in, a, in a different way. They haven't become universities, but they have embedded a kind of lived experience. And we're beginning to see very exciting and little, I'm sure, very dynamic in the future that it's not just the academics or the curators that begin to tell the story, it's actually other constituencies. When we open Tate Modern, every label had a name. And I did wonder when we opened, why are all those names curators? And now they're not. You know, this is a guide to a walk through Tate Modern which is authored not just by curators but other members of staff. And now we're beginning to move on to start generating these talks with people from, well, they're not from outside institutions, they are constituents, but they are members of public. But there are still so many uh, huge uh, learnings from that period um, that I'm still processing, and that, you know, they're a hard one, and um, they are easy left. Um, but the thing that I think the biggest learning for me, and I think that the thing that we're most at risk of losing, is the importance of long-term planning, even though you don't know where you're going to go. Because a short-term plan always brings you to a known destination. It's all as we all know we're going to be. Let's think about where we're going to be in 20 years and kind of imagine the impossible. You know, we want to journey without quite knowing how we're going to get there because then we can be intuitive, we can respond to temporalities, to different weather, to different climates, we can be open. We have to be open. We have to be navigators. And I think we're losing that now. I think I, I really feel strongly that we need to be future orientated. The other learning, I think, is that what we did in 2000 felt really radical and super aligned. But now, it actually just feels the norm. So I think we need to break them all again. I don't know how we'll do it, but then is the next stop. It's been great, but let's do something different again. And I would love my successor to take it all apart, not to return to chronology, but find another way of building a museum for the next um, part of the 21st century. Um, the second thing I want to talk about, and I'm going to be brief about this because time is rushing on, is just how we have used this great space. You know, this is a kind of, if the first part was about evolutionary change, this is much more about reactive. What I've just mentioned, be on your, the balls of your feet. This, well, this is such a great space. It was envisaged by the, arch, by the architects, Hertzog and Demian, as a covered street. You know, a place where people would meet, would walk through the building, encounters with strangers. Traffic, everyday encounters. Like I, I don't really like the model of the street because, of course, streets are highly um, supervised places. They're police, they're scary places. People get knocked over and they're always under scrutiny, particularly in the UK. And I, like, I prefer the idea that this is a park where different things can coexist very happily. Rich and poor go to park, kids play football, you know, lovers meet. Um, but from the, from the start, it was the site of large scale commissions. And the first two artists, this is Louise Bourgeois' um, Great Powers, but, and the second was Spanish artist Juan Munoz, the late Juan Munoz. Both of those artists played on, played on this notion of a covered street. In 2004, Oliver and Allison bought a, then a young, emerging, not well known artist, created the Weather Project, which was based on complex um, scrutiny of institutional practice and metaphors with the environment, but essentially was a created this huge public space with this great orb of light. And the, the, the roof was glass, it was silver, mirrored. And we had no idea how people would react. But what happened was that people took ownership of the space. It created the kind of energy. It almost, you, you can't invent the energy, but it created energy, and people came in. It was the first time that Tate Modern kind of turned in, got that magic that, that it now so often has. 
But what was really interesting was not so long after the opening, to find this happening. And this was on the occasion of George Bush's visit to the UK. I don't know who these people were, whether they were activists or just people coming to the building after lunch, saying that they could do things together in the space, the power, power to change. And this was in the papers, all in the papers, this go home, terribly embarrassing to our government, but it did kick off. And it occurred the ongoing tradition of extraordinary creative activism, playing to the visibility uh, of the space and the kind of desire for social media um, coverage. It actually has to say it hasn't been an easy journey. If I was, um, you know, if I was doing my press release talk, I'd just say this is extraordinary, which now I'm doing it and grabbed it. But it was very, very problematic for very many, many years. And I found this as I was, uh, just before I was leaving yesterday, this is a report by somebody called John Jordan, who brought a group of young people to a um, workshop that we had um, tested around activism. And uh, he happened to be an activist. Anyway, so during the course of this workshop, the young people, um, uh, this guy, wanted to go and do a demonstration, but they were absolutely held back, you know, by uh, public health, uh, health and safety, by our front of health, a very, very risk of earth. And afterwards, in public, he wrote an absolute condemnation of censorship. And uh, uh, um, remarked that his wonderful, young, positive students experience at first hand the hypocrisy of cultural institutions that claim to the sites of progressive practice. Um, and I think that was a, a, a lesson uh, learnt uh, by Kate. But um, my own position as director, one of the first things I did was to talk to our health and safety people and our front of house and our security and insist with our agreement, of course, that if people wanted to protest, as long as nobody got hurt and no law was broken, they had every right. That if we really were going to call this a covered street or a park, that's what we had to do. And um, actually, there have been some amazing protests, but often learning into the art, which has been incredibly exciting. This is Joyce Salcedo's Great Crack, which rent the building. A song of it. Here's a group of um, you know, people campaigning for living wage, but using that work of art, a kind of collaborative function. I don't think artists have led the way. Um, and I'm really seeing how that works. And this is a, 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 an amazing uh, um, activation by Liberate Tate, a group of uh, uh, activists calling on Tate to lead the relationship with BP over many years, really embarrassing for the institution. But for people like me who are very climate conscious, fantastic. Bring it on. And uh, finally, I think we were so embarrassed, uh, we, we, um, you know, the relationship came to an end, which allowed us to declare a climate emergency. Kind of began, okay, so this, we understood that there was a space that we could work with in relation to a kind of agenda of social change. Without being accused of hypocrisy, and it's a very, very difficult line to tread, but we invited the Cuban activist, Jenny uh, Bagara, to come and work with us. And um, I suppose that the reason we invited her was that we spent it striking the obvious point that if you want a real relationship with your community, you actually need to be active within it. And we asked from an artist just felt much more powerful than the art from the director. You know, come and have coffee with me. So Tanya came in and she wanted to work with a group of neighbours. Uh, she wanted them to be self selecting She wanted them to be paid. She wanted us to dedicate a significant amount of money to ensure that there was a legacy for the project over the next 15 years. And she wanted me and other senior colleagues to be part of the project and part of the discussion. And the group of neighbours, and there's a small little, little group of them here, and the guy that Tanya is touching is a resident in this little arms house. It's a, it's a residency for old people, you know, publicly funded social housing. But you'll see what our neighbourhood is like now for Kate. These little pockets of Victorian London. 
And then the great big agenda of uh, economic regeneration is big, huge real estate development. I'm very sorry. But she works with this wonderful group of people. I say wonderful, they were terrifying. And um, well, I ran with the first in and I interrogated difficult questions. What were our ethics? Could they see the rules of this? Why did we do this? Why did we do that? And it really was an exercise in how far an institution will go to challenge itself. And I was out with rather disappointing work in the Turbine Hall by Tanya, which we have long forgotten. But what the real uh, radical um, achievement for Tanya, against all expectations, that we named our building after a local social worker and activist, Natalie Bell. And this came apart because we had promised that we would work with the neighbours to achieve some of their aims. And at one point in these negotiations, they asked me if we could, on their behalf, take down the name of Len Vavatnik from our new building. Len Vavatnik had provided £50 million pounds to build our extension in 2016, and it had a big brass deck on it, double in fact. And honestly, I didn't know what to say. John, there was. There's no way I could take down. He had naming rights. We couldn't lose the 50 million. So, in a light bulb moment, I said, we can't do that, but we can name another building. And you can choose the person who you name. So, at the centre of this, bit, this picture is Tanya. And in the right centre is Natalie Bell. And she's standing in front of her building, the Natalie Bell building. Just as prominent, in fact, more so than the Vibatnik building. And I managed to persuade the trustees that we should do this on the basis that we did it for one year. But of course, the end of the year happened, the main stayed, and the next year, and the next year, and the next year. But what the I talked about value earlier, and you know, the complexity of financial value, what that does, it distorts the notion. And in my view, men, they're all their faces after wealthy people who have the privilege of getting money. But actually, what we do is we honor artists, and we honor our public, our communities. So this is putting Natalie's name up there to show that we value, her social value is just as important to us as the economic, the financial value of Lens Blackness. So I just, again, I'm really over time, but I want to talk very briefly, and it will be brief, about uh, kind of coming out of that and supporting this. So that was the third and in the kind of circumstantial, you know, responding. And this was a project called Post Exchange, which we initiated in 2016. It ran for four years. And it was an absolutely deliberate attempt to set up a kind of open experiment for scrutinizing and um, experimenting with notions of the social value of art. It was kind of like, let's get real about this. So it's only evident um, that art has a value beyond the gallery walls to our communities with our constituencies. And it was in response partly to two major reports of that year. One was a report that the Gallus Gavankin Commission uh, inquired the civic role of art published in 2016, where they basically described um, museums with five roles. One was a role that museums have to perform as colleges, they are places of learning. The second is that they need to be like town halls, places of debate. The third is they need to be like parks. You already have a park. So pub a public space open to everybody. Then they also they recognize the kind of traditional family of the temple. You know, the places which give meaning and provide solace. And fifth, the museum should be like a home, a place of safety and belonging. And I think what they, what they pointed out, that, that you know, the combination of roles does give museums a very unique place. Um, you know, they have missions around social change, but what they also inspire is that combination of, you know, the intrinsic, the institutional that we talked about earlier. But of course, what the Girl Bank didn't talk about was the equal potential museums, in my view, had to bore people to confuse them, to make them feel stupid, to alienate them, and exclude them. And 
developments in the same way as evidenced by another report, which is called the White Report, published in the UK, which identified a, a growing, an alarming, growing gap between the public taste, you could like the Netflix taste, the, the social media, the TikTok, and what the, what the public culture, public culture offer was doing. So, so this is the, the challenge of relevance, relevance, and if you lose relevance, you lose trust. So those sorts of girls are fed into this experimental process. And I've just, you know, this, this, the name is to demonstrate what this exchange was. It was a messy, gruffy, noisy, lively, inspiring, confusing, irritating space. We worked with about 80 different partner organisations, from universities to uh, special needs schools, to health agencies, to artist collectives, uh, radio operators, uh, newspapers, and it uh, tragically opened just days after the Brexit vote. And of course, it's four years that are framed by a really acute period of crisis of uh, climate intolerance, um, the growing moment of the culture wars, etc., etc. But it did stunning service for those four years, and it was experimental. Um, and what it did brilliantly was it published all its findings. It was, when I say open, it was open. It was very, very um, unashamedly transparent about what it did. Um, I remember Anna Cutler, who was the director at that time of learning, saying uh, she described the project as a role reversal of the conventional show and tell model of museum learning, where we tell the public. And in this case, it was the public telling us, a little bit like Tanya Bagara. And of course, there were some great things about it. It certainly democratised the space. Um, I think that our, met, our learning colleagues loved about it. It put learning as social practice first. The curatorial kind of went back into the box a little bit. Nothing had to be perfect there. Everything is really perfect in the museum. This space is perfect. The galleries are beautiful. This is a messy space. It was a space for doing things as well as talking about them. Um, it had a devastating impact on the diversity of the audience. The people who came were very different people. A lot of people came for the first time. It felt like a safe space. And it galvanized lots of partnerships and networks. It really had a kind of ecological impact. But at the same time, I think it was a silo. I think there was a feeling that it kept people in this space that then they didn't come into the museum. Oddly enough, art was quite often siloed too. It was more about social practice. It didn't manage that marriage. And some of those days, some of those days, it's just found it incredibly difficult to work with a big museum. You know, we are enormous. We're, it's quite terrifying for communities to come into a place like this. And of course, in theory, it was a very fast and democratic project. But actually, when you're a big institution, you hold the balance of power. So it was, it came to an end in COVID and it had a uh, number of difficult, difficult conversations, difficult personalities. And what we've replaced it with today is something that's more akin to what the Barcelona, Barcelonian architect Manuel de Sola Morales has described as urban acupuncture. We take a health metaphor, so small, small initiatives, often bottom up. Uh, interventions that kind of harness more directly the community, a little bit like the Tanya Bidea, that have positive energy. And some of those, I hope, will start coming back into tape over coming years. The first one will be when we saw the Australian Aboriginal artist Richard Barrett's um, Embassy Kent. But as a place of meeting and debate and workshopping, but not behind a wall, We'll put it in the middle of the turbine hall on the bridge. It'll be absolutely at that, that centre, the upper centre of the park. Um, I know time is running out, but I want to make some observations about the changing nature of museums. And of course, traditionally, art has been the foundation of sacrosanct in the collection, commissions, exhibitions. But commissions complicate because they've been placed into play, and the actual space that is the Fairbairn Hall has, has built that new kind of practice that then you've been in self-exchange. 
But what I think that is an issue now, and maybe we'll be talking about over the next few days, is more the art thing at the heart, more the place, but the idea, and I think this is, and this is what, where we are now, but the circumstances or context of the space and time, the now, is as important. Because we are living in a time of permacrisis, we cannot get the present moment out of our heads, and it just impacts on all our future thinking. But with that in mind, we actually need to live with dissonance and paradox and conflict. There's no easy way around it. Um, and they are produced, those conflicts, many of them, by our own essentially incompatible um, discourses within the museum. The discourse of government, the discourse of financial responsibility of public life of the art. So, a few final observations. The first one is that if you are going to be more public facing, as we all have to become, you have to be more useful. This is a picture of us doing inoculations during COVID. It's the only way. We have to be literally a public space. We serve the public. If our public wants us to do this, we have to do it. Then I want to describe my ambition for Kate as a university with a playground attached. Um, but let's be very clear, play has to come first. Play is more important than the university. Play comes before learning. It's part, it's the very foundational beginning of cognitive development. So there'll be no learning, no accessibility, no communication, no making without play. And so uh, as institutions like Tate campaign for the value of art education in our schools, and this is under threat in the UK, we also have to put that engagement at the heart of what we do. Children learning has to be as big as any turbine or project. It simply has to be the kids are as important as the artists. They are our future artists. And we also need to demonstrate leadership. We really have to be leaders. We have to do it in collaboration. We've declared a climate emergency at the invitation of artists who came into our survey hall as demonstrators and we welcomed them in. It was timely. But in so declaring, we have to build that narrative into everything we do, into our, our commissions, the team of the CUNA, currently on indigenous artists from Chile, all about the the petrified forest left after the, the tires had gone back. And we have to walk the talk. We have to make our buildings sustainable. We have to demonstrate that, the, that, that, that what we believe in is also um, guiding our behaviours. And not just our behaviours, but our structures and our systems. And for the very first time, we're beginning to acquire uh, art, not for imperpetuity. This is a work we've acquired by uh, Guatemalan artist, Edgar Callel. We have acquired a 12-year lease on the work. It will never occupy our storage. So, climate is remodeling system change in the way the world needs to model system change. Then, of course, culture wars. And this is a terrifying moment. We are at a moment where there's an urgent need to interrogate and lay bare our past. This is Carl Walker's incredible deconstruction and critique of the Victoria Memorial outside Buckingham Palace. But at the same time, we have to celebrate our nation now. So this is you know, the paradox. There's one queen that we applaud and another queen we deconstruct. It's an uneasy balance, but we have to do both things. And of course, as I said, um, the discourse of financial sustainability. Americans are likely to become more private just as we urge ourselves to become more public. And what does that actually mean? What it really means is that, of course, we are under ever greater scrutiny. And this is a picture in the middle of um, Mel Golding, amazing American activist and fantastic photographer. We've taken the stockler name off all our buildings, and I worked hard with Nan Golden to persuade our trustees 
to remove the statue's name from our escalators and our lifts. But there will be others, many others, and there will be artists, again, artists always, who, who, who we trust, and they trust us. If we will turn that trust, we will act in partnership with them. So it's not my own. I was at Alaskan, and um, let's describe my hymns as among the many immune systems, talking about COVID, Muslim is among the many immune systems necessary to our society. And immune systems are embedded in bodies, often barely visible, but they are an integral part of our ability to lead healthy lives. And that's actually, to me, encapsulates everything about the museum. And now more than ever, as museum professionals, as visitors, as artists, we all need to look after ourselves because society needs us and the pair will begin with us. Thank you.